Hello. Welcome to my video on how I edit my wedding films. Your good old YouTube dad is back. Today we're going to talk about how to edit a wedding film from start to finish in Premiere Pro. Show you the back end of my Premiere. Now before anything starts, I want you yeah, look at the timestamp of this video. All right. It's long. I get it. But if you really want to invest in being able to understand and know how to edit wedding films or edit films in general in Premiere Pro, please, please carve out the time to watch this whole thing because it's going to be so informative for you and give you knowledge that you wouldn't be able to find really anywhere else without paying for something or piecemealing a bunch of different tutorials together throughout YouTube. So I kindly ask you stick with me, watch it all the way through and learn a bunch of stuff. Okay. We're in this together squad fam and I'm not here to abandon you because I'm your YouTube dad and I love you and I want what's best for you. Let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Musicbed, the music licensing platform that has been my go-to for everything, wedding films and filmmaking in general, when it comes to licensing music. I've been using these guys for seven years and I'm so pumped that they reached out to me to do a sponsored video. Having been a musician for most of my life, music selection is a very critical and important part of the process for filmmaking for me. So I really care about where I'm licensing my music. It really made me upset when I realized I couldn't just like use Bon Iver all the time on all my wedding films. Licensing radio hits and big indie artists isn't a reality for most small business people like us. All of their music is uh, small independent artists that are indie as well. And there's just so much nuance and diversity within their library uh, that I always find exactly what I need for my films. So if you've ever seen any of my stuff on YouTube or any of the films that I've put out into the world, Pretty much all of it has been music bed music. Every time I go to their website, there's brand new music and always fun stuff to look forward to. Now to prove my love for their music, I want to do a little montage for you of dancing to my favorite tunes from their website. <laughs> Dance, jam, sequence, let's go. You don't like this music, you don't be listening to it, you know. All right, let's edit. So the first thing I do when I create a wedding film, well, obviously I film it, and I back up all my footage in multiple places. After I have backed up all of my footage and it's on a drive, uh, normally in best case scenario, I will dump all that footage onto the hard drive and solid state on my laptop to be able to do a workflow like that. But in the middle of wedding season, that doesn't always happen. So sometimes I work off these drives. This isn't a Thunderbolt drive, but I'm always making sure that I render my footage in Premiere and play it back. I'll show you some of those details, how I increase the efficiency of that in the software. After that, I go straight to music right away. I want to select music to lay a base for the film and set the tone. Now for years, I selected the music myself because I thought I was the best decision maker on this, uh, but quickly realized that I wanted to include my clients in this process as well. So what I do is I actually go to Musicbed's website and I curate a favorites list always. Every time I go to Musicbed's website, I always look at their banner. Look, it's my friend Roland. You need to go listen to Roland Lewis's new album. It's unbelievable. Please go listen to Roland. No matter how busy I am, I always put, when I pull up the website, I see this and I click the new music and I go and listen to all of it. And if there's anything that stands out that I really like, I go ahead and give it a little heart, give it a favorite. After I've listened to all that music, I can go to my account in the my music section and i have a favorites list over here and this is literally all of the favorites that i've picked on music bed and i usually like to go to most recent because that's fresh and exciting and interesting and helps me get creative so all of these are hearted and what i can do is i can go to this little uh add project add to project button and i can pick a project that i've created so the couple's name and I can add a little note about why I like this song. So I might be like cinematic, edgy, vibey, dynamic, different adjectives that they can see it. I could see notes about each song and why I like it. And I can save that song to a project. And when I go over to the projects tab, I will find that couple's project, which is the one I'm showing you today, Christina and Nick, and I can view all 
of the songs here. And so what I do is I usually compile eight to 12 songs and I send them an email with a URL to this project. So it's a beautiful layout of all the songs. And I say, I go ahead and say, hey, pick your favorite or a couple favorite songs from this list and we'll go from there. And so I just love that to be a collaborative effort. I love for the clients to have a say in it because nothing's worse than delivering a project and people being like, I, I love the film, but I, I just, I can't do that song. Like that's just the worst thing to hear after you've worked your tail off to make a film. So I love collaborating with clients on the front end on this. This gives me the power to choose music that I like and I'm willing to work with and will allow me to, to be and feel creative, but also gives them the power to make a decision as well. If I really like a song and I feel like it fits, I will highly suggest that. And most of the time, my clients really uh, trust me. And so they'll go with that song usually. So I send that off once I get the music back, then I start building the Premiere Pro project. So last year, Musicbed announced their subscription-based model, which was an absolute godsend for me because before I was buying one to two licenses per wedding film, uh, and they're $50 a license usually for, for weddings. And so that started to be a cost that was adding up throughout the year, spending nearly you know $1,000 on music, music licensing. And like, don't get me wrong, that's still a crazy affordable price for music licensing. You're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars for radio hits. So uh, it's still very affordable, but they made it even more affordable with their subscription model. And with, their, with the personal model for subscription, it starts at $9.99 a month. So if you're just making films for yourself, only 10 bucks a month and you can uh, start having access to that. For the wedding subscription, it's $59.99 a month. So if you're doing, you know, a dozen to 25 to 40 weddings a year, it's a no brainer to get the subscription and you get unlimited downloads of non royalty free music. Now, what I mean by non royalty free music is they do not take away the rights to the artists that they are picking and they handpick indie artists that are up and coming and really working hard in the industry, much like you are as a creative. The artists that are featured on their site are also making money. Uh, which is really cool. I love being able to support them, but then you get access to really download whatever you want. So recently, since I have the subscription based model, I've been adding more than two songs, which I normally did in years past. I've been adding three or maybe four songs, finding songs that are in the same key and kind of blending them together. So it's, it's a really cool opportunity. What's really amazing is Musicbed is offering you guys, my audience, if you are wedding filmmakers, or even if you're just doing it for YouTube or personal work, you can get a month free of their subscription plan. I would highly recommend that you take them up on that, that you go to Musicbed, get that month free and use the code, all caps, Eric Floberg, and you can get going on that. Now let's open up a Premiere project and let's get this bread. Let's train this grain. Let's, I almost said Putin that gluten. Does that make me a traitor? <laughs> We're shooting that gluten, baby. All right, so when you pull up Premiere, you can select a new project. And so I will title this Nick and Christina. So you get your interface of Premiere. And what I like to do is I like to just import all the footage. A lot of people like to organize their footage by putting it into folders and subfolders like B-roll, A-roll, ceremony, speeches, dances, breaking it up that way. What I like to do is it just gives me ease of mind to just dump all the footage in one folder and then I import it into Premiere from there. So obviously go to import, wedding film with Christina and Nick here. Now theirs is a little bit different because uh, we shot a formal ceremony in a small Catholic church that they did with their family. So I put that in a subfolder, but all of their wedding day was literally just put in this wedding folder. I highlight all by command A and hit import. So obviously this is gonna take a little while, but once all of this footage is imported, then I like to organize it within Premiere. All the footage is imported now. If you go down to the bottom under those thumbnails, you can, click new bin, which is basically a subfolder within the project. So what I like to do is I start, I like to start organizing the footage with bins. So I'll create a bin and I'll say getting ready. And then with the getting ready footage, I will start putting all that footage into that bin. So if you click this little section right here, you can go to media start and it will chronologically order all of your footage. All of this footage here down through, we'll say here, is getting ready. So I highlight all that. 
Uh, if you just click one, hit shift and click the last one, you drag it onto the getting ready folder. Now I won't do that for everyone because you recognize how that works now. So I will uh, do that into like six different folders of getting ready, ceremony, portraits, reception, speeches, late night. You can organize it however you want. Uh, I usually do about six bins and it just really helps me find footage when I need it. Secondly, after I've made all of my bins, I'm gonna go ahead and import all of my audio. So I can make a bin for audio. Just click that little icon again and I will create an audio bin. If you double click it, it opens up a new tab in that window. And so your bin opens, there's nothing in this bin. So I will go to file and import or you could do command I and I will go to the wedding audio folder for Christina and Nick where I dumped all of the audio for the day. So that is uh, my task cam recorder that I'm plugging into a speaker. That is lav mics that I'm putting on people throughout the day. That is a handheld um, recording device that I put on the microphones for speeches. And I plan on doing more of that in the future, teaching you how that audio stuff works. But for now, uh, I will just highlight all this audio and I'll import it into that audio bin. So now I have all my audio in one place. I have all my footage uh, culled and put and organized into different bins and all of it's organized within Premiere. That's how I like to do it. That's how I like to be organized. That's how I start. Now, the first thing after I've organized all my footage and my audio, I will go to the audio tab after I've made music selection. My music selection was put in my audio folder. So that is within the audio bin now. I will find that song that I want to start with. And I will drag it into the project. So that's always the first thing that goes into my project to set the mood of how I want to start. Like I said, music is a very important integral part of my editing process. So that is always how I start a film. I either do that if I have an idea in my head of how I want to start, or uh, I will go to my pen and notepad and I will straight up listen to all the audio throughout the day. And I'm literally going pen and paper uh, to this thing and I'm listening to all the audio throughout the day. So I'm listening to all the speeches on a wedding. I'm listening to the first look. I'm listening to the ceremony and their vows. And I'm literally going to the audio file and I'm timestamping what people are saying. I'm literally writing a timestamp of important things that are said in speeches, in vows, uh, and starring them and making note of it. So that when I go to make the edit, I can refer back to this audio list to start building a story uh, and building a narrative in the film montage. Now, when I first started doing wedding films, I did a full long hour, hour and a half long edit with a full ceremony, getting ready at the beginning, full ceremony into portraits, into reception, all the details, all the speeches, all the dances from start to finish. I came to realize that that was way too laborious and a friend said, you should start doing montages. People will pay the same, if not more, uh, for a jam packed edit with speeches, with music, uh, that's all tied together. And you can watch it in three to six minutes and you can pass along via email, share it on social media and your friends and family will actually sit down and watch it. You don't have to pull out the popcorn and make it a movie night every time you view your wedding film. So that's how I go about editing my films. And this is a very integral part of that because this is really the backbone of all the films is the speeches and the audio throughout the day. And so really what I lean into a lot is uh, important people's speeches and the couple's vows. And so I kind of let that thread the narrative throughout my films and it's always a good reference when I'm constructing that montage. So now that I know all of the audio that I want to use for the wedding day and I've made note of that, uh, I have my music set in place. I start to think back of my school days of when I wrote essays. Now your teachers always talk to you about having an intro and a body and a conclusion or a hook and a rising action and a climax and a falling action and a resolution. This is basic plot and storyline composition. You, you learned it in English class if you went to school and you recognize that every story needs some sort of beginning, middle, end. Casey Neistat talks about that a lot. Same thing applies for wedding films. You need to have some sort of hook at the beginning of your film if you want people to watch it. Now, you have to recognize that your films are marketing for your own brand. So if a complete stranger is watching your video, you want to suck them in in any way possible that will keep them watching for the whole five, six minutes of your film. So that means that you need to make a hook right away. You need to make 
make something that's interesting that's going to grab their attention and then you can start telling a narrative. Then you can start telling something sequential um, with a timeline. So what I like to do is I brainstorm about what's different about my couple and I create something like that. I built this project so that you could see how I got started with a project, but I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the actual finish edit from Nick and Christina's wedding. And you can see how I kind of piecemealed the beginning together. So where do I start? Uh, the moment I saw you walk into Algebra 1 with those pearly white Jordans, I knew that one day you'd be my wife. All right, so Christina and Nick uh, were those clients that really fell in love with my work and were really personal and made that known in our first meeting. So I really wanted to dive deep with them, get to know them, get to know their preferences, their style, all that good stuff. So we had dinner, like we invited them over for dinner uh, before their wedding and got to know them. And I realized they had a, a life in the city here in Chicago but they were having their wedding out in Princeton, Illinois, which is just like kind of in the middle of nowhere and farmland because that's where they grew up. So that was meaningful to them. Uh, but there was still a part of me that wanted to include the city somehow since it was such an integral and special part of their life now and moving forward because I think they don't really want to leave. That plus uh, there was this component of her dad on her wedding day. Her dad is in really bad health right now. She wasn't sure if uh, her dad was even going to make it to the wedding day. And I know you're watching this, Christina. Uh, so thank you so much for trusting me with your, your vision and being open about all of this stuff. On the wedding day, I was out filming Nick getting ready. And when I came back inside, I, Christina was in the middle of reading uh, her letter to her dad. And so I caught the last end of the moment and I just felt like I needed to kind of have a redo on that. So I asked them to film in their apartment and I recorded audio of her reading her letter to her dad. And so I used it as this opportunity for another hook for the film. So that's what I ended up doing. Now, consequentially, <laughs> In that meeting where I hung out with them, we we talked about how uh, Nick proposed and the story of how I proposed to my wife. And Christina sent me a video of the security camera footage in their apartment that I shot in with them of Nick proposing. So they gave me the footage of their proposal. And then I had all this footage of them hanging out and like being in love in their apartment. And so it felt like this perfect combination of, okay, this is where their story started with the proposal and I'm gonna integrate them living in this space as well. So that's what I did for this hook. So that's obviously different than most wedding films you've probably seen just because, again, I love this concept of leaning into what makes me different, standing out from the crowd, creating a hook that's going to make people go, this is totally different than anything I'm used to. And then all of a sudden you're just planting seeds in people's brains of this is, this is higher quality than what is the norm, which is true. You're, you're really going above and beyond to make it different. I'm not afraid to use cell phone footage, security cam footage. If it's going to be meaningful and it's gonna stand out in the story, that's way more important than you having perfect flawless log footage. That's just my opinion. Uh, a lot of people might be in the high end market and they do that thing and nobody wants that and that's fine, but I am willing to make the risk and creative risk for my clients to do something that's just gonna make them absolutely ball. 
And that's what's happening here. And that's what made this opening so special. One more example, uh, one of my favorite films, and I've shared this on the channel before, Ellie and Tyler's wedding in Yosemite. I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that that wedding was in Yosemite. And so I started with a crazy montage of Yosemite. Hi, Tyler. Take you, Elizabeth, to be my wife. Hi, Elizabeth. Take you, Tyler, to be my husband. <sighs> Promise to be faithful to you. In good times and in bad. And in sickness and in health. And to love you and honor you. All the days of my life. Then once that montage was done, I cre started creating a more linear timeline, a more linear story of how everything unfolded, which started in Chicago. They had a small ceremony there and then they packed and got ready and left for California to go out to Yosemite. And then I introduced that scene. But I wanted that hook. I wanted people to know this was an epic adventure wedding in Yosemite. And that's how I hooked people into watching that one before I started telling the linear story. So that was the same case here. We got the hook. We got something that's really interesting. And then I started telling a linear story. Now, this is where creativity starts. This is where your film is going to be your own and that there's only so much that I can teach you in the editing process that you can absorb and learn and uh, use and replicate for yourself. But your own creative touch and your own creative mind is what's going to develop your own style and your own voice. So you can't just lean on the exact things that I'm telling you here. Uh, definitely use them as fuel for your own creativity and any tips and tricks or skills that you learn here. Yeah, put them into practice, but make it your own. Now, uh, something I didn't show uh, in this is that when you drop in a clip into your timeline, Premiere will automatically uh, adjust the project file to the dimensions of that clip. So if you shot the day in 1080p, you are going to have a, a 1920 by 1080p timeline. Uh, if you shot in 4K, it's going to do a 4K timeline. And so something that I do that's a bit different is I like the 2.35 to one aspect ratio. You might be just saying like, what is that? Have you seen those YouTubers who are like, no, I'm going to cut to my B-roll. And they go, when they put those bars on the top and the bottom, they're cutting to a 2.35 to one ratio uh, to make it look more cinematic. Now, the reason for that is anamorphic lenses create that format, that really widescreen cinematic look. Uh, if you've seen like the moment anamorphic lens or any hollywood film like ever they have that widescreen look so that's something i like to incorporate as well with making it look more cinematic in the past i used to put bars on top and bottom but then realized that in my premiere pro sequence i could literally change the dimensions to be those exact dimensions so for this video i shot most of the day in 1080p so i made the sequence 1920 which is the width of normal 1080 footage but I crammed the vertical into 815. So 1920 by 815, and that's the 2.35 to one ratio. And so when you make that change up here in the sequence settings, you'll need to make sure that you hit custom up in this top editing mode, and then make sure it's 1920 by 815, and it will make the change down here as well and making sure that the timeline is in 23.976, 24 frames per second. Once you hit okay, 
then it will reformat your project to be that widescreen look. So what's great about this as well is if it, it gives you the option to move your footage. So it gives you a little space to move it up and down. So if you put some footage in this sequence now, that's 1920 by 1080, you can go over to this little motion tab over on the left in your effects controls panel, and you can take the vertical placement and rock it up and down and move your footage. Now, if you go too far, you start getting black on top and bottom, but you can move it to the ex exact spot that you want. So it's a really cool way to kind of work with uh, footage if you didn't frame it exactly how you wanted it. For the sake of showing you kind of all the ins and outs of the starting of a project, I'm just gonna open a new sequence here. So you can see basically what we just did. Settings, you go to custom, making sure that this is 815, 1920 by 815. Now, the next thing I do after I've put in music, created a hook on the project, sometimes I'll do this before, just depending on how I'm feeling. I don't do it the same exact way every time, but it kind of follows this format. After I put in the music, kind of done that hook thing, I will go down to this new item section at the bottom of the footage in the bins, and I will make an adjustment layer. So it's gonna, with the settings that we just made, so 1920 by 815 at 24 frames per second, you're going to make that adjustment layer and it will create that adjustment layer in whatever panel you are in. I'm in the audio panel right now, so I don't want it in there. I'm gonna put it in the wedding panel. So go down here, adjustment layer, settings are right, boom. Just made a new adjustment layer. I'm going to drag that adjustment layer to my sequence and I'm going to extend it all the way. I usually extend it to about six minutes because that's usually how long my films are. This adjustment layer is where my LUT is going to sit. A LUT is, is short for look up table. This is what I apply to my footage to give it that look, to give it those colors that contrast a certain look. And so I'm not going to share which LUT I use because that's coming in the future. And I actually have some exciting plans uh, of what that will look like. And hopefully I will have something uh, available for purchase sometime in the near future. I will go over to the section over here, which is Lumetri Color over to the right. And I will go to the basic correction tab. And right here it says input LUT. I will select uh, my, my go-to LUT. So once I select, once I select that LUT, uh, it's going on that adjustment layer. So that adjustment layer was highlighted and it's going right on there. So I'm just gonna throw a piece of footage in there so you can see um, what it does to that footage. So I have a piece of footage on there now with the LUT applied. So you can see uh, when I toggle off the look here, if I delete that layer right there or make it not visible, you can see the original footage that with my flat profile. And if I apply it, you can see the color that it puts on the footage. Now, I don't want it to look that intense. And so I always dial back this LUT to about 30 to 50% opacity. So it's not super strong. So I go over to this little section in my effects control, effect control panels and I take the opacity and I bring it down to about 30%. So that LUT is applied to all my footage across the board on my film as I edit it. I'm a simple man. I shoot on a flat profile on Canon cameras. A lot of people will shoot log profiles, which is way more intricate with color grading, um, with adjusting a curve and then applying a LUT afterwards, maybe even going into scopes and doing fancy stuff with that. I'm not about that life. I like simple editing. So I like an adjustment layer over all my footage with a flat profile. I put the LUT on the adjustment layer, opacity down, and then I will, at the end, you'll see, I go through all the clips and I go through the basic adjustments and add contrast and saturation and exposure adjustments and do it really simple, really similar to photo editing, which is primarily what I do as a wedding and portrait photographer. Awesome, so I'm back to my sequence of the full edited film, so you can see this perspective now. Now, after I have chosen my music, listened to all my audio, culled all of my footage and put it in bins and organized it, 
put an adjustment layer with a LUT over all of my footage, created a hook. I am now ready to start with a linear timeline of telling the story of the day. So made my hook, put in a title. I'm a simple man again. I just use legacy, legacy title up here, file new legacy title brings you up to this page. Very simple text. I like Gotham. I like Montserrat, Helvetica maybe. Keep it really simple. So then I start moving into a linear section of storytelling. So in this film specifically, I set the scene. I set the, at the scene showing that it was a rainy and foggy day that Nick was getting uh, ready and hanging out at his parents' bar and that Christina was getting ready at the venue with some of the details. If you're shooting footage in slow motion, you're either shooting in 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second. It's very important that you know how to slow that footage down in post. If you're shooting 30 frames per second, you're gonna want to right click on your footage or your clip, or I've set up a shortcut where you just hit S and it brings you to the speed panel, to the speed panel. And if you're shooting 30 frames per second, you have a 24 frames per second timeline. You wanna hit 80% because 80% of 30 is 24. If you're shooting 60 frames per second, you wanna make sure that number is 40% because 40% of 60 is 24. Now, my camera, when I shoot 120 super slow motion, it formats it and plays it back in 30 frames per second. So whenever I slow down 30 frame per second footage, I always slow it down to 80%. You're not doing 20% that's what you would think it would be that's only if it's playing back at full speed so most of the time it's it's slowing it down to 30 frames per second you slow it down to 80 frames per second just a little tip for you so i start doing a linear timeline and i really like to start introducing voices after i've set the scene so in this circumstance uh, i just went right into their first look and Nick's vows. Now, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty and specifics of this film and how I put all this stuff together. Like I said earlier, this is up to you and your creative endeavors. You can go do that. You can figure that out. What I like to do is I start stacking footage. I like going up and down on the rows that I have here, stacking footage and placing it in line with the beat of the song. If, I, if you ever see me do anything that's a bit tricky uh, with um, a stylized look like earlier in the, the hook at the end of it. We saw this kind of double exposure thing happening with their silhouettes and the tree. I will stack two pieces of footage on top of each other right here. And I will decrease the opacity of one of them. So this image right here on top is their silhouettes. So if I got rid of the bottom one, you'd see it's their silhouettes but it's their silhouettes at 40% opacity, which I changed in the effect control panel over here. And now you have this blend of them and the tree. Now, if you ever see any kind of flickering uh, that I have in my films, I literally go to the clip and cut it. I will cut it apart and match it to the beats of the music. And I will manually do that. There's no preset that I do uh, that changes that. I will literally go in and I've made all fancy shortcuts, which I'll, which I'll get to in a second, but I believe the standard shortcut in Premiere is C for the cut tool. If you hit C, you can start uh, chopping up clips with that cut tool and you can start moving stuff around to add that kind of flicker effect. So I'll just show you a quick example of what that looks like here. So if I wanted to do that flicker effect here, I would cut this in multiple places and I would remove sections of the clip so that when I play it back, you'll see, well, I have to remove this lower layer. You'll see, no, obviously that's not where you would do that. That was just showing you how that works. But I do that at really heightened moments, like on the dance floor to get kind of that flicker film kind of look. When it comes to shortcuts on the keyboard, there are a bunch that I like to use. I'm probably not gonna get to all of them, but C is one of those really important ones. C for the cut tool. If I put any other footage that's smaller or larger than my sequence size, like if my timeline is in 1920 by 815 and I shot a clip in 4K, it's gonna be really zoomed in. 
So if I drop a 4K clip into the timeline, I just hit the question mark uh, and forward slash button, and that will bring it to the correct size. If you need to make any more adjustments on that, you click the clip and you go to the scale button on your effect control panels and you can zoom it in or bring it out if you need to. Um, and then obviously adjust its position up and down if need be as well because you have that adjustment. Something that I custom mapped is R for render. If you hit R, it's going to render um, the whole project um, from your in and out points. So if I just wanna render a certain portion of the film, say the first minute, I can have it from the start here. If I right click, drag my cursor all the way to the left, right click, I can say mark in the one minute mark. I can hit mark out. Now this whole section is what's going to be rendered. Custom map, hit the R, now it's going to render. Rendering is just uh, allowing your computer to understand and interpret the footage to be able to play it back for you at uh, the, the speed that you need it to play back at without like glitching or slowing down. Throughout the project, you're gonna wanna render this stuff so it plays back nicely. And you can also go to this little panel here and play it back at half resolution or a fourth resolution uh, so that it's not chewing up as much memory on your computer and it'll play back nicely so that you can watch all your footage uh, the way you need to. Now to do your own keyboard shortcuts, you can go up to the Premiere Pro tab up here and you go to keyboard shortcuts. Now this will bring up your whole keyboard and what you can do is you can search up any kind of effect uh, in Premiere. So if I wanted to go to duplicate, I would type in duplicate, D-U-P, and duplicate comes up. Now, D is the shortcut for duplicate, but if I wanted to change that, I can click that right here and I can change it to P, which I don't want to do, but you get the idea. I changed my R to render. I've only done this for a few things, but if, if you wanna go nuts with these, go nuts. It can really help your workflow if you start becoming fluent and using it that way. One of my favorite keyboard shortcuts that I made for myself is M for mustache. See? Now ladies, I know you could probably program yours L for legs and then U for underarms. <laughs> Just your YouTube dad. Being a YouTube dad. Again, this is where all the magic happens for you. Uh, you need to figure out how you are going to comprise your story. And there's only so much I can teach on that. Uh, there's, a, there's only so many tips and tricks that I can give you on how to make it awesome. And ultimately your awesome might be completely different than my awesome. And that's why you can watch my films. That's why you can watch other people in the industry's films and you can get inspiration from them and start replicating or using uh, the same skills and tactics and things that they do uh, in order to stand out and look different. Because I'm nitpicky about certain things, I will throughout the film kind of color and edit uh, how things look along the way. Uh, but I won't, I won't do everything. And the same goes for audio. I will change audio levels. So uh, if you look over to the right over here, you have levels. You have it showing if, if your audio levels are peaking or not. If it's getting into that red section and peaking, you obviously need to tone it down. So there's a couple ways to do that. You can either go over to your leveler over here in the effect controls panel. You can create keyframes where uh, it, it goes down in certain parts. So if something peaks at a certain point or someone speaks really loudly, you can create a keyframe here with this little icon, add or remove a keyframe at a certain decibel to lower or raise the volume of that clip. So that's one way to do it. You can only max it out at 6 dBs above zero. So if you need to really boost that up, I like to go to the effects panel over here and use parametric EQ. Parametric equalizer, I drag it onto my effects panel, which is here. And if you go to the little edit section, you can raise the dB level over here to raise uh, the volume of the clip. But a lot of times when you do that synthetically, you start getting hisses and different things. So. I like to go to the section um, where that hissing is happening. So finding the hertz of where that's happening, 
you can go down to this number he, down here, not the decibels, but the number under that, and that's increasing the intensity of the spike that you want at the certain hertz. So if it's, say it's spiking at, you know, 11,000 hertz, you can find that spike. It'll be really hissy in your ears and you just drop that down and get rid of it. Really good technique I've learned from my buddy Mike who does audio stuff and never would have known this otherwise. Uh, really cleans up your audio and makes it sound very nice. Now, that's my other plug that I have. Gotta switch hats because I can't, I can't wear my headphones with my cool hat. Swapping over to my Mango Street merch. Shout out to Daniel Rachel. Here I have my Sony WH-1000 XM3s. I'm not a fan of the name, but I'm a fan of the headphones. If you want to generally listen back to audio at their Bluetooth, um, so you just turn them on and you can connect to Bluetooth on your computer, but that doesn't work in Premiere Pro. If you want to use Bluetooth headset, Bluetooth headphones in Premiere, you need to go to preferences and audio hardware, and then change your default output to your Bluetooth device in, in order to hear everything. Highly, highly, highly recommend these headphones. They're noise canceling. You could edit in an airport, edit anywhere, not be distracted, hear exactly what you need to hear, make sure your audio isn't peaking. It's amazing. You don't wanna do the whole Bluetooth workaround. They also have a passive eighth inch cord that can run from the headset to your computer just like normal headphones. These are linked in the description. Feel free to check them out. Can't recommend them enough. So like I said, I will, throughout the film, kind of, if something's way out of whack, I will go over to the Lumetri color panel. I will uh, change audio to make it sound or look better in the moment because that's just gonna help me be more creative and sane if I do that along the way. And so like I said, I have my adjustment layer with my LUT across everything but I go in here to change a bit of white balance or exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, all that good stuff, saturation. Uh, and if I absolutely need to, I can go down to the curves section and mess with the curve if anything's out of whack, or I can really mess with the colors in an image. So if I don't like this green back here, I can change the saturation of the green. I can make it look more green. You do that by touching this little dripper and bringing it to a color that you want and it will select three points and that middle point is where you place the dripper so if i want to increase the orange or red that's obviously ridiculous on her skin that kind of stuff don't need that but i did that with the green i boosted the green saturation a little bit this next one is hue you can change the hue of a color so if orange is looking too red or magenta you can make it more green um, same thing you just use the dripper and move it up and down and Luma, uh, you can change the brightness of a color. So you select that dripper, bring it on to something, bring the, the brightness up or down um, to your preference. Really cool to be able to um, isolate all of your colors and manage it well in those panels. But yeah, that's what I do as my last pass. So that's really kind of where I want to close this here is going through my last pass of visual and audio. I will go from start to finish on the whole film after I've cut together the whole thing, and I will check all of my audio first. So I will go into all of my audio files, into the parametric equalizer, um, listen with my headphones intently, looking for if it's spiking or not over to the right here, and make sure that all of those levels are working well. I'm gonna make sure that all of the really big climactic parts are nice and loud but not peaking and some of the quieter parts are still being heard but not as intense as those climactic parts. Then after all of my audio is done, I will go through and individually on every clip, um, go through and add contrast and go through the basic corrections of making that clip look exactly how I want it if the LUT isn't doing its job on the footage. Now I'm shooting with a flat profile and a, a LUT at 30 to 50% opacity. So a lot of times it needs more contrast. So I'll crank up that contrast slider or uh, the black slider down here. And that's really kind of messing with the tone curve, honestly. So I will make sure that that color pass is done and then I will look through it one more time. And then it's time for export. So if I click on my sequence panel right here and have it highlighted, I can hit a shortcut Command M for 
export and that will bring me to my export panel. I highly recommend you check out Matt Johnson's videos about these things. He's way more intelligent than I am about this and I've pretty much learned all that I need to know about the technical things from him. He's a YouTuber, he's got a huge beard, he's a wedding filmmaker, very knowledgeable guy. You need to go check him out. I'll put his channel in the description. It's actually pretty simple here. I will rename the file. Usually it is the file name of the song that I put in there first because that was the first thing I dropped in the timeline. So I will change that to the couple's names, Christina and Nick. And you gotta use a plus sign because we're all hip millennials. Change the name of the file and make sure that it's going to a source that I want. Usually my desktop is where I like to put it. Now, this is really important, and Matt came out with a video about this recently. If you've used Premiere in the past, you might have noticed this struggle that your colors come out a lot more flat and less contrasted when you export. There is a special LUT that can be applied to that footage so that your footage looks exactly the same as it did in your Premiere project. This was groundbreaking for me this year. I don't have that LUT on hand. I will link Matt's video right here. Basically, Adobe just gives you a LUT to apply to the footage um, to make sure that it is exporting exactly the same color and contrast as what you're seeing in your project. So I apply that, hit this little checkbox, and I go to my folder where I have that resaturate LUT, which is what I call it, resaturate. So resaturate is applied. It doesn't say it's applied. It says none, but it's there, I promise. I like to make sure that my project is being exported at the resolution and the dimensions that I want. I actually upscaled this whole video to 4K or just about 4K. You want to make sure that your resolution is exactly what you want. I upscaled this to near 4K, but making sure that your uh, resolution is the aspect ratio that you did in the beginning. So 2.35 to 1. You can do the math by dividing that big number by the small number. I like to click the use maximum render quality box just to get the best quality out of it. Then I go ahead and export the whole project. Then it's exported. I upload it to Vimeo and or YouTube. And I deliver my videos through Vimeo. And they can download that clip right from Vimeo in the download section at full resolution right from that platform. So I don't have to deliver anything in the mail. Unless they ordered raw footage from me, which a lot of people do. And I make a completely different timeline in a Premiere project, sequence all of the footage sequentially, export it as one file and down res it so that I can get it under 32 gigabytes, put it on a 32 gig flash drive in a nice little wooden box and send it off in the mail to them. Yeah, my films are four to six minutes long. That's how all of them end up, you know, the length of all of them end up being. But these films usually end up taking me like a full work week to edit. So it's not an easy endeavor. A lot of times to finish it out, I have to like stay up till midnight or uh, three, five in the morning just to finish it. And so, it, yeah, it's, it's not easy. If you really want your clients to experience a film that's just going to make them cry and, and freak out, then it's going to take that much hard work. And that really brings me to my last point is that all this stuff is great. Like knowing all of it is awesome and knowing all the ins and outs of editing to make sure you are at the top of your game or always improving is awesome. And you should always be doing that. But if there is no heart, behind what you're doing and there's no service of your clients and making sure that they are getting what they deserve and what they want, then you're not winning. You're not doing this well. You need to make sure that your clients are happy. You can't just be making films that they aren't connecting with just because you want to be creative or do your own thing or stand out so much uh, that they're not enjoying the product. They're the people that need to be thought of most when you're making these. And so really understanding them, their story, uh, their love for one another, that's what's most important. And that's what's most important to convey in their film. Thank you so much for watching this video. If it was helpful to you, I know everybody says this at the end of every video, but honestly, sincerely, if this video was helpful for you, please give it a like, comment below. Uh, any other questions that you might have or anything that you think I might benefit from. I love hearing your perspective on things that I can do better with my editing workflow because Lord knows I still need help with it. And uh, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe uh, and ring that little notification bell to get notified whenever I post a new video like this to help you out if I help you at all. Uh, maybe. Thank you to Musicbed again for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to check out the link in the description for one free month with them. 
I love them. Can't say enough about them. Eric Floberg signing off for the night because I need to sleep because I'm shooting a wedding tomorrow. Don't forget to lean into what makes you different. And I will catch you on the flippity flop. I need to shave my mustache. Far from falling. <laughs>